from the get-go, the main guy who's investigating the case is saying, this was self-defense, this was self-defense, this was self-defense, and I want to know why it didn't matter to the prosecutor and why it didn't matter to the jury. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today we're talking about the recent murder conviction of Sergeant Daniel Perry in a self-defense incident, what happened, why we think the jury decided the way they decided, and what the state of Texas and Governor Greg Abbott are going to do about it. But before we get started, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And today's show sponsor is Arms List. Are you looking for a deal? Check out Arms List. Shop your local area for amazing face-to-face deals or check out their nationwide network from over 1,300 FFL dealers. Sell your items in your local area. No sales fees, nonsense, or other BS. Just become a member, pay your low monthly membership, and enjoy all the benefits. Get access to exclusive deals from partners on Armsless Marketplace and buy in as little as two clicks. Thanks to Armsless for sponsoring this episode. All right, imagine if you will transport it back to the summer of love. We had riots going on all over the place. We are in Austin, Texas. We have armed riders in the streets. This is BLM protesters, Garrett Foster being one of them, carrying an AK-47. Sergeant Perry comes into contact with these people. You know, threat ensues. Daniel Perry shoots Garrett Foster in response to, you know, what he says is a imminent threat of deadly force. Mm -hmm. And transport is forward three years later. Took a long time to get a trial for this, but he is convicted of murder. Right. After, what, 17 hours of jury deliberation? So um, quite a long time for then a guilty verdict to be had. Yeah. And I I mean, a lot of things jump out at me in this one in particular, but I think this is, I think we'll start with looking at just kind of the self-defense incident in general, but how much the jury relied on what happened before you know, we look at what happens during and then after when these folks evaluate a self-defense claim and how he might have been sunk for things that happened that maybe completely are apparently irrelevant to the self-defense incident. Yes. So I'd like to get Edwin Walker's thoughts on this. Welcome, Edwin. We heard your calls for more Edwin, but not less Emily. So here we go. Yeah, sidecar. <laughs> so this is our first our first three-person video. And I think that it's important that we all talk on this because this really, I mean, it, it really goes to the core of who we are and what we do. I mean, we all do self-defense law. We're all here in Texas. So we're very intimately familiar with the rules of evidence, what should have been in the jury charge, what the judge should have admitted, what he shouldn't have admitted. And and the jury charge is very important. Oh, yeah. It's the most important document in any criminal case, especially a, a self-defense case. And so I would, I'm, I'm really hoping to get my hands on a copy of that jury charge because there's so much language that should have been in it that is very pro-defendant. Did he get an instruction on no duty to retreat? Did he get an instruction on the castle doctrine, on the, you know, the presumption of reasonableness? Did he get instruction on multiple assailants, which in which the law says that if one assailant attacks you with deadly force, you're justified in shooting any of the assailants. It goes back to our law of parties uh, that we have in Texas here that says basically if you're involved in a crime, then, you know, if you're the lookout and uh, Mr. Blonde suddenly, suddenly goes crazy and starts shooting all of the clerks at the jewelry store, you're just as guilty of murder as he is. Didn't Daniel Perry get the benefit of all of those? Were they understood by the jury? And yes, the 17 hour thing, you know, you here in Texas, the prosecution has to prove they have the burden of persuasion to show beyond a reasonable doubt that self-defense doesn't apply. So if these folks went in there and debated this for 17 hours, that kind of de facto says that there were people in there that had reasonable doubts. If you're a juror on this jury and you changed your vote from not guilty to guilty, then all I can say is shame on you because you abandoned, basically what you're saying is my doubts were not reasonable. And and I don't see how somebody could say that. Yes. Shame on them. I agree with that. However, I disagree that the jury charge, even if it, I mean, even if it was a completely perfect jury charge and we had all the self-defense language in there and everything that was, I don't think that that had anything to do with what they decided. Yeah, I, I and I this has been my experience. Jurors usually go in, they do like an initial vote. You know, do we have and in this case felony 12 jurors. And so we won't know what that initial makeup, but clearly, I mean they did, they weren't unanimous out of the start and from my understanding is the things that they requested was witness testimony. They didn't request any of the videos, they didn't request any 911 calls, any of the, the scientific stuff. And so I think that's pretty fascinating, but to Emily's point and I, 
I want to hear what your thoughts on this are, Emily, because let's assume we have a perfect jury charge. I mean, two things that I'm certain are in there are there's no duty for the defendant to testify. We know he Bingo. didn't. We know he didn't testify. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, I'm sure he got a stand your ground. I'm certain he did, but I think this came down to, and this is just Emily speculating. I think this came down to those. Facebook messages that got introduced into evidence because bear in mind, and you've heard us talk before several times in past videos about the things that you do and say, the things that you wear, the stickers on your truck, how that can negatively affect your self-defense case. And there's a lot of people in the comments who are like, if these guys were good lawyers, that would never come into trial. We have zero control, right? We can make the best arguments in the world and a judge is going to look and say, it's relevant. Or it's not relevant. And it is a statement of the defendant, which makes it, it is an exception to the hearsay rules. You said it, right? Or it is a, you know, like, well, we're talking about text messages. It's not hearsay. It's not hearsay. So is it more prejudicial than probative? And if the answer is nope, it's going to come in. And so we have these messages from Facebook Messenger, private messages that came in that were hugely prejudicial. Things like, oh, these guys are going to commit suicide by me, right? Talking about protesters and looters. Um, nothing to do with the actual incident that occurred, but things he said before the incident occurred. And I am 100% certain that the jury looked at those messages. They saw that they did not hear from him on the stand, which they're not supposed to consider. And no. they said, guilty. And well, that's also one thing they're not supposed to consider is that assuming that he did get a no duty to retreat instruction that is specifically written in the jury charge. You are not to consider whether or not that. And yet in most of the commentary, that's what I've been hearing is that, uh, that the prosecution actually argued that, well, he had so many options that he could have driven away, but they're not allowed to argue that there's, I mean, but who do you rely on to enforce that? You rely on the judge, and that's why this 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 case should be full of appellate issues regarding was the judge correct in letting in all those mm-hmm. prior statements? Did the judge give a proper jury instruction? Did the judge, you know, did the defense object whenever? Because you know we've we've had similar cases, and any time the prosecution even you start with a motion limine, say this is so prejudicial, I'm asking the judge to to cut it off before the mm-hmm. jury's even sat. Uh, so that it won't come in. And the minute they open their mouth about, well, isn't it true that you could have, you stop that prosecutor immediately and don't even allow them to ring that bell. So we, you know, so we're going to see that. Uh, But yeah, you're right. A lot of people don't understand the fact that what they say is not covered by your right against self-incrimination. You can self-incriminate yourself all over the place, um, and that's going to be admissible. It's not hearsay because it comes out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. So everything you say outside of court is coming in, and people just need to realize that, especially in the days of social media, that uh, you know, my mother always said that don't ever do anything that you don't want put on the front page of the newspaper. And that goes now even more so. Don't put anything on Facebook that you don't want coming into a possible criminal trial on self-defense. Well, and the other thing that I saw by a lot of commentators are, you know, Daniel Perry didn't testify in his own defense. You know, Fifth Amendment, we are not legally required. Uh, You know, if you're charged with a crime, you're accused of a crime. I mean, the burden is 100% on the government to, you know, basically prove up this crime and we're not going to have these Chinese style struggle sessions where we make you, you know, falsely confess or do all these other things. Um, But, and we see this in jury charges, I mean, they will be expressly instructed not to consider the defendant's failure to Mm -hmm. testify or assuming we had our stand your ground, you know, you're not to consider that for any legal reason. Jurors just seem to have a really hard time following the law. And I, I, I don't want to sound judgmental of his defense team because we were not there, right? And being a defense attorney in these sort of cases is really, really hard. But at the same time, it's, you know, I understand, you know, your gut is client shouldn't testify. That's defense attorney baseline, right? And then bring into it these Facebook messages, which were highly prejudicial. You don't want him cross-examined on the stand about all those things because there's just no good reason. Why were you talking about shooting all these guys so much, Daniel Perry? There's no good answers. However, on balance, and of course, from the cold light of day and in hindsight with a murder conviction, should he have taken the stand anyway? And, and my answer is probably yes. Well, you know, well, that just shows how difficult it is and how strategies have to change during trial mm-hmm. because 
what they were relying on to get the issue of self-defense out there was the the video interview that he did with the police, mm-hmm. the 911 call he made. Those established self-defense. Yes. So, yes, if it was just – if there was no extra circumstances uh, that had to be dealt with, that is enough to get self-defense. Yep. That says I was in fear. That says – you know, that describes the situation. Um, that's fantastic because those are not subject to cross-examination, and it, and it puts the issue in front of the jury where you get it on a jury charge. But, yeah, when the, when the prosecutor pops up with all this other stuff that may not have been anticipated or may not have had the – uh, had more of an impact than you thought it would. At that point, you've got to address it because that's one of the things the jury's going to occupy most of their 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 time talking about. Now that said, and then I have a question for Richard. But that said, Edwin, you and I have had a murder trial together in which I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the fact that we put our guy on the stand to testify might have been what got him convicted of murder. Well, and that's why, you know that, what I'm about. well, that's why it's always, that's why you, you're right. Yeah. Defense attorneys say, don't put your client on the stand because you don't know how they're going to react under pressure. You don't know how they're going to answer questions. You don't know if they're going to look evasive or combative on the stand. That just goes to the personality and somebody can, it and, is tough. Yeah. And somebody can change. You know, we've also had a case where, are you know where the defendant was absolutely perfect he was articulate he was he, he was very calm he was very metered in everything he said he was not flustered by any question at all and he had right, a perfect answer the right demeanor right because it's mm-hmm. tough in a self defense case you have to split this baby between you know yes i am sorry that someone is dead but i'm not sorry that i preserved my own life and it's a tough like you you really do have to have the right defendant with the right temperament to be able to say look look, I am horrified that this person put me in this scenario. I never wanted to be here, but would I do it again? Yeah. You know, without sounding like either I regret what I did or I just wanted to kill somebody. And it's, it, you have to have the right, the right person on the stand too. So um, I want to hear what Richard has to say about this lead detective and the fact that from the get-go, the main guy who's investigating the case is saying, this was self-defense, this was self-defense, this was self-defense. And I want to know why it didn't matter to the prosecutor and why it didn't matter to the jury. Yeah, and looking at the filings in this case, I mean, it looks like the defense team really did a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they moved for prosecutorial misconduct, they moved for multiple motions to dismiss. There was no change of venue filed in this case, which probably seems like they might, you know, hindsight yeah. 2020. I, I don't, don't know if I would have, though, because yeah. they, they just don't get granted. So no, like, they, don't, they don't get granted. At what point do you keep asking for the thing you know you're not going to get, and then right. do you lose credibility with the judge? You know, yeah, I don't know. You have, you have a lot of that, but clearly, I mean, this is where we have lead detective, and this is just goes to a perfect illustration of how juries are complete wild animals and there is no control over Mm -hmm. this. And, you know, we have these conversations with clients about, hey, we got this, you know, bird in the hand here or question mark, you know, we don't know what the guaranteed outcome is going to be. But the lead detective in this case said this was a clear cut case of self-defense. The jury completely disregarded what the lead detective had to say. Um, And going back to those messages, you know, we have, you know, I know, Probably people are like, this isn't relevant. And I can I can hear the frustration. Um, but that kind of material can come in to show lack of mistake or mm-hmm. motive, or there's all these exceptions to the rules of evidence well, plus, that, that make it impossible that these come in. Yeah. And- in a homicide in Texas, in a homicide, when you are alleging that the dead victim was the first aggressor, you yeah. are opening the door to... Your, your peaceableness. Yeah. Your own peaceableness. And yeah. so is that the way they brought it in? You know, right. because you can do it through reputation evidence, but you could also argue do you want to do it through specific instances of conduct? And I mean, I don't know. Is that how they wanted to get it in? Yeah. And I mean, it's the I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. I mean, Daniel Perry got judged by 12. You know, here in Texas, what people may not know is whenever you're convicted of murder, you do not get an appeal bond. Mm-hmm. You cannot you are not eligible for probation. You go directly to jail. And I think that every single news story that covered it showed him being cuffed, having take off his suit jacket, being cuffed. So Daniel Perry has spent every second in custody since that verdict was written. And he will spend every second in custody until he is either the, the appellate court agrees with him. He, uh, you know, gets his, uh, you know, he eventually gets a, uh, uh, paroled perhaps, um, or pardoned. So setting that aside, I would love to see an appellate record on this to find out 
you know, what the judge did that was wrong, what the judge did that was correct, um, how the jury charge was written, but we may not get that opportunity. No. And I, this is going to be, it's just going to sound bizarre. I know you guys think I'm bizarre. Um, do I think that Daniel Perry should be convicted of murder? No. Absolutely not. I think there is plenty of reasonable doubt in this case to say he was under assault and he defended his life. That said, I'm like mildly annoyed that Greg Abbott has jumped in with this pardon so quickly. And I think I'm just annoyed because like I have a client sitting in prison for a self-defense murder case. Hello, Governor Abbott. I have a proposition for you. Yeah, I mean, let's but let's do the right thing, but let's do the right thing on a global scale. Push. Guess what? Texas has a bill filed right now for pretrial immunity hearings. Thank you, House Representative Briscoe Kane, for your efforts on that regard, because that's how we make big change for every Texan who needs it. And I'm I am annoyed that because this happens to be in Austin, it happens to be high profile, and it happens to be that let's be honest, Texas House Republicans are not really getting their job done this That's session, true. that I think leadership is jumping in with this big flashy pardon, which is, it's all well and good. Good for Daniel Perry. I'm very happy about it, but come on. Yeah. So the process going forward, um, Governor Greg Abbott has said that he has recommended uh, this case for a pardon to the Board of Pardons and Paroles. You know, we see several hundred pardon requests filed every year. The board has gotten better in recent years and recommends about half, you know, the people mm. who apply for a pardon, they recommend them, hey, grant these guys pardons. Uh, but from that, we see governor the governor historically yeah, I mean, signs five or less of these things. So um, if you, of the thousands and thousands of convictions we see every year, we see, you know, two to seven pardons every year. I mean, your chances of getting yeah. a pardon are less than 5%. I can think of a dozen self-defenders who yeah. have been put in prison in the last five years who desperately deserve a pardon. What are we doing for them? Yeah, no, exactly right. And so, I mean, him recommending that, knowing that the board will recommend it, I mean, probably, I mean, if he's putting pressure on them to recommend a pardon. Well, yeah, he's going to pardon the guy. Yeah, he's going to pardon good. And again, I, I do not want to take away, yes, Daniel Perry does not deserve to be in prison for this. And right. I think that is very, very good. But but do the right thing globally, not yeah. just help this one guy. Yeah. You know what else is amazing about this case and and kind of is it, it does make you wonder how he got convicted is that most of our most of the the self defense cases that go to trial uh, are cases where an individual shot an unarmed person and in this case out of every protester he could have shot he shot the guy with the gun yes yeah so he did not shoot an unarmed individual he shot the guy who was closest to his car who actually had a gun. And yet he still wound up convicted. Travis County jury, very liberal jury. Um, I wonder if they didn't disregard that detective because um, they hate Austin police. Department. They hate the police. I mean, that's I mean, they are so, so, so far left. I mean, we had protesters out there actively protesting the Austin Police Department. And then the Austin Police Department comes to the <laughs> to this guy's defense. Right. I can see them saying, well, well. <laughs> well, and like, and maybe like, you know, are, is the jury thinking was the Austin Police Department not doing a proper investigation um, because they're mad at the protesters because the protesters protesting Austin Police Department? Yeah, again, so, again, hindsight might have been good to bring in an outside agency. You know, if we oh, had, if we they had, should have had the Rangers. Yeah, if we had the Ranger or the Sheriff come yeah. in and come to the same conclusion, maybe that would have provided it more weight. But there is something that I think folks can do, especially here if you're in the state of Texas. We have HB 5283 by Briscoe Kane, and that would, I think, it's a pretrial immunity hearing. And I think that would really hold prosecutors' feet to the fire because when we look at these cases, and I think it's a good reminder, I mean, the police aren't required to consider self-defense. Mm -mm. Uh, grand juries aren't required to consider mm -hmm. self-defense. The prosecutor, when evaluating their case, the only people who... The prosecutor is definitely not going to no, consider self-defense. But the only people who are legally required to consider self-defense are a trial judge or trial jury. And I think by moving that process up, I mean, we see a big undermining of self-defense, not just in Texas, but across the United States. Um, it's time to revisit these statutes and, and beef up self-defense going forward. But yep. we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. Thank you to Edwin Walker for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And please leave us a comment. Let us know what you think of this verdict, what you think of Greg Abbott's uh, promise for a pardon, and what you think maybe should happen going forward. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.